Oh, that's a good one. Intermission's over. Okay, the three traders. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth into the king of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's revelations right out of the Bible. And what do you think the three unclean spirits represent in the end? It's all about the ego, right? And that's what we're going to look at when we look at the three traitors. Just the different manifestations in the ego of the ego, sorry, in the three bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, three of the bodies. The three traitors. The three traitors are an ancient esoteric symbol of our inner psychology. They appear in a lot of different places. The three traitors constitute the returning ego, the I, that needs to be dissolved in order to incarnate the internal Christ. Okay, so the three traitors, just like we have the solar hero, which keeps showing up in stories again and again and again. Just like we have the concept of the Divine Mother, which keeps showing up in stories again and again and again. We see another feature when we study the world's stories and fables and religions. We find this concept of the three traitors. Okay, the three traitors are a symbol for the ego, the manifestation of the ego in different bodies, in different centers of the mind. You want to think of it like that. They show up in the Christian gospel as Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas. Okay? In the crucifixion scene, in the drama surrounding Jesus' life, we have these three factors, or these three individuals. They also appear in the Old Testament as well. Now, not too many people are familiar with the Old Testament, and the solar hero of the New Testament is obviously Jesus. Okay, and these people plot against him to have him basically killed, right? Well, in the Old Testament, the solar hero there is Moses. And Kor, Dathan, and Abaron, they lead a revolt against Moses to try to take him down. And in the end, the interesting thing that happens to them is they're captured. Um, they don't actually uh, kill Moses. These guys are captured, and they're beheaded, which is kind of cool. The concept of decapitation, which is oftentimes shows up as symbolism for elimination of the ego. Think of Hercules, you had to chop the heads off the seven-headed hydra as an example. So that concept of decapitation comes up with the elimination of the ego. Okay, so they show up as Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas in the New Testament, Old Testament, the core Dathan and Abaron. Uh, if you want to get all Masonic, uh, they show up in the Masonic legend of Hiram Abif as Sibel or Toluk and Stokin. Hiram Abif, it's, he's an, an Egyptian figure. He's like the solar hero of the Egyptian times as far as the Masons are concerned. Okay, and he has uh, three individuals that show up to kill him, okay, in the way Jesus is killed. And those three individuals are Sibel, or Toluk and Stokin. <coughs> <coughs> They're the three Egyptian demons who killed Osiris. Because when we study the, the mythology behind Osiris, he's killed by three demons. The red demons are set. And he's chopped up into four pieces and thrown to the four corners of the world. And mm -hmm. Isis comes along, gathers the pieces, puts back together, and reanimates him. He's <coughs> reborn again. They're the three furies from Greek mythology. You probably heard about them as well. These three t traitors are related to our three brains. They're basically the manifestation of the ego in the intellectual center, in the emotional center, and the motor slash instinctive slash sexual center. Remember way back we looked at the three centers, and we, or the five centers, we said we kind of clump them, in, clump them into three brains, the thinkers, the feelers, and the doers. We played that game of which one might be you, and we talked a little bit about that. You know, the people that are always pursuing uh, knowledge and reading books and going to school, you know, the kind of the artists stereotype, and then the, the jock working out fitness freak stereotype, right? That's what the three traders are. They represent the manifestation of the ego in those three brains, in those three centers. They're also related with the three bodies as well. The manifestation of the ego in the astral, the mental, and the very root of the ego, the origin of all our errors, is actually found in the council world, in the council body. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> They quote, the first is the demon of desire, the second is the demon of the mind, and the third is the demon of evil will, sometimes called ill will. The first one, the demon of desire, is inside the astral body, and related with the emotions. The second one is inside the mental body, and related with the thoughts. The third is inside the body of will, which is the council body. All of these three together are the black dragon with three heads. 
They are also Sabal, Ortolut, and Stokin, the three traders of Firama beef. In short, these three unclean spirits are our psychological I, the ego, and the myself. <coughs> That's a quote from Master Solomon <coughs> speaking about the three traders. Demon of desire, which is related with the emotional center and the astral plane. Mm -hmm. Demon of the mind, which is related with the intellectual center and the mental plane. And the demon of ill will or evil will, which is associated with the council world and the body of the will, the council body. Three traitors mortally hate the seeker Christ and lead him to his death within us. And what we're going to do today uh, in this lecture, we're going to have a little bit of a more in-depth look at the great cosmic drama surrounding the life of Jesus, at the crucifixion. Okay, Judas, he represented the demon of desire. Now what was it Judas did? He sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, right? That represents how we sell out our higher self, our inner God, for, you know, liquor, money, fame, vanity, basically the illusion and the materialism of the, the physical world that we're in. That's what he represents, the manifestation of the ego in that particular center. Okay? We all exchange our own inner God for the materialistic world, okay? for the illusion that we see before us. Pilate, he represents the demon of the mind. Remember Pilate was the, the Roman emperor that when Jesus was brought before him, he physically made the gesture of washing his hands and said to the people, you do what you want with him. I have nothing to do with that. That's the demon of the mind. Um, that's us declaring innocence, never accepting blame, justifying all our actions, and seeking evasions to avoid responsibility. If there's anything about this society that we know right now, nobody takes responsibility for anything ever, right? That's one of the features the that buck. we see, passing the buck. That's this. That's the ego working intellectual center. We regularly excuse behavior in ourselves that we wouldn't tolerate for a, a minute in somebody else. But it's different because we have an excuse, right? Well, when you do it, it's this, but, well, I was in a hurry, or I do this, or I do that. There's many times in our life we've all done something we knew wasn't right, but we justified it. We had a reason why we could get away with it, or why we had to do it, or why the situation, the laws, the customs didn't apply to us in that moment. That was represented in a cosmic drama with Pilate washing his hands saying, it's got nothing to do with me, it's whatever you guys want to do. Okay, where he had the ability to say, no, he's going free, leave him alone. He went, yeah, I want nothing to do with this. It's all on your heads right now. And that's what we tend to do. We declare our own innocence, never accepting the blame always trying to avoid responsibility. And Caiaphas, Caiaphas was, uh, he was like the, the Jewish leader at the time that uh, he was getting competition from Jesus. Mm -hmm. He was coming to Jesus preaching mm -hmm. this new stuff and Caiaphas represented kind of like the old guard, the old school religion at the time. And he was the one that set the whole thing up in the first place. He was the one yeah. plotting to take Jesus down. He was like, this new guy is really getting on my nerves. We've got to get him out of here. We've got to take him down. And that represents the demon of ill will, of bad intention. You can think of it that way. He incessantly betrays the Lord within us. He never does the will of the Father. The Lord gives him the staff to lead his sheep, because he's a religious leader, right? But the cynical traitor turns the altar into a bed of pleasures, fornicates incessantly, and sells the sacraments. So rather than finding a true path and helping people you know, awaken consciousness, Caiaphas was more concerned about his own position and the political influence that he had and how that was being threatened. So he basically plotted against the will of the Father. And that's what we do as well. Uh, we have a, 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 our Father who art in heaven, and we never do his will. We just always do the will that we want, the will of the ego. And that's us acting as Caiaphas. So these three characters <coughs> in the role of the cosmic drama meant something much more than you know three people that did a bunch of stuff. They were symbolic. There was a message here. And it's funny because um, a few years ago, remember they found the Gospel of Judas? And mm -hmm. one of the big revelations in the yeah. Gospel of Judas was Jesus approached Judas and says, yeah. I need you to do something for me. It's because Jesus knew all this and was creating this drama. He was doing a great play for all of humanity, and he was picking the actors in that play and what was going to happen. Because he was leaving a message that was going to last for a very long time, and here we are 2,000 years later, we all know these characters. Okay, we've just forgotten the importance of the message, and that's what we're looking at today. Uh, and when we look at the Egyptian story, the, the Masonic legend, the three traitors of Hirama Beef, he was the solar hero, he's the Jesus, we see Sibel, Ortolut, and Stokin, and we see something similar. Uh, the three were decapitated, 
their heads were thrown in the fire, and their ashes thrown to the four corners of the earth, to the four winds. That's what happens to, to these guys when they're caught. Mm. Now, the first one, Sabal, he sneaks up and he hits Hiram with a ruler. And that was very symbolic, because that represented how the just are assassinated in the name of law and order. Okay, how the law and order of the time basically assassinates, assassinates the just, uh, reigns over them. Uh, the second one, Ortolut, then sneaks up. So this guy, this guy Sabal, sneaks up and hits Hiram with a ruler. Then this guy comes up and hits him with a big board, a big plank of wood. And that represented how the prejudices and beliefs of each time period bring death upon the great initiates. Okay, and this is, this is a Masonic legend. This is what the Masons are right into. The third one, Stokin, hits him with a hammer. And that represents how the violence of these epoch assassinates the just and prohibits the diffusion of the secret doctrine. And these are the three forces in society, in culture, that work to suppress the teachings, that work to keep us from, you know, incarnating our own inner Christ. Okay, because all these things are acting on us to prevent us from realizing our own inner Christ. So every day we assassinate our own Hiram Abif. We crucify our own Jesus, our own Lord, within ourselves. In our psychological depths, multiple eagles yell, asking for the crucifixion of our inner Lord. So remember the whole scene where Jesus is brought before the crowd? That's in our own mind. The crowd are the hundreds of eagles that we carry within. The Jesus that's brought there, that's our, our inner Christ. And the three roles were Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas, representing that crowd, the eagle, manifesting in the three centers, the three brains. The victim of the three traitors is always the internal Christ in all of us, our inner being, that we basically crucify again and again and again and again by letting the crowd choose his fate, the crowd being the ego. Remember our inner being? There's basically three aspects to it, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, okay, the Trinity. If you don't like that, you can call it positive, negative, neutral, or you can call it Isis, Osiris, and Horus, or you can call it Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu. doesn't matter, it's all really the same thing. We sin against the Father when we lie. We sin against the Son when we feel hatred, anger, violence. And we sin against the Holy Spirit when we lose the energies. Okay, when we spill the energies. That's the kind of stuff that we do daily. We think of it like that. The Father is truth. The Son is conscious love, and the Holy Spirit represents the sexual fires, the kundalini, the perfect matrimony. Okay, so to, to realize, to do the opposite, to, to incarnate these principles of the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father would be truth, conscious love, and alchemy. Right, that's basically what, what we're trying to do. But instead we choose to, you know, tell falsehood, and to lie, and to hate, and, and you know, which is the opposite of love, and to not work with the sexual fires, but to lose them. In our inner work, we have to directly experience the cosmic drama. What Jesus did, that whole process, that play that he basically put on that would be remembered for thousands of years, that was a process that has to happen to us internally. Okay, the big thing Jesus did was that normal, what would have been an internal process, he did externally for everyone to see. The cosmic drama, then, is not exclusive to Jesus. All masters have to live the cosmic drama within themselves. At some point, we're all going to have to go through that process. The life of Jesus was interesting, but that life that he lived was a process, a process eventually all of us have to go through at one level or another. The interesting thing that Jesus did is he performed that, that process that normally happened internally, he performed it publicly in order for all of humanity to be opened into that drama of initiation, to basically teach us the three paths, to teach us the process. It's not that he was, you know, it wasn't unique to him, he wasn't the only person to ever do it. There's lots of people that have experienced that drama, all the waking masters have. The only thing Jesus did differently was basically presented as a giant play that would be remembered for thousands of years. And he was obviously quite successful at that. Okay? And that's where, just talking about that Gospel of Judas, where it shows that Jesus orchestrated it long before it happened. And he was handpicking the characters, the actors, that were going to play those various roles. And that was something that came up with the Gospel of Judas, where Judas is basically horrified when Jesus says, I need you to do this. You're going to you know, go to these Roman soldiers and you're going to sell me out. And 
Judas doesn't want to, but Jesus says, you know, it's really important you do this. I have a, a role, I have this vision in mind that I want to fulfill. Big quote. Out of doubts, every one of us carries in his mind the three traitors. Judas, the demon of desire, Pilate, the demon of the mind, Caiaphas, the demon of evil or ill will. These three traitors crucified the Lord of Perfections in the bottom of our soul. It's about three specific types of inhuman elements in the cosmic drama. No doubt at all, this drama has been lived in secret in the depth of the superlative consciousness of the human being. Then is not the cosmic drama a property of the great Kabir Jesus, as the learned ignorance suppose? The initiated of all times, the masters of all centuries, have lived the cosmic drama inside themselves here and now. But the great Kabir Jesus had the courage to represent this intimate drama in public, in the street and daylight, to open the sense of initiation for every human being without difference of race, sex, culture, or color. It is wonderful that someone taught the intimate drama in public for everyone on earth. That's a quote from Master Samuel describing the whole process that Jesus went through. Just letting us know it was all orchestrated, it was set up to be a lesson for us. Knowledge that was going to be handed down for thousands of years. The secret Christ is the Lord of the Great Rebellion, rejected by the priests, the elders, and the scribes of the temple. Because that was Jesus, right? He was rejected by the priests, the elders, and the scribes of the temples. Okay? The priests hated him because they don't understand him. They wanted him to live in accordance with their unshakable dogmas. So the idea of the priests plotting against Jesus or being against Jesus, you could be kind of looking at it as you know, um, organized religion being against any kind of spirituality. Look how long Christianity and Catholicism repressed any kind of new age or spiritual path or anything else like that. Even looking at the life of Master Samael, the most recent master that we have, look at the uh, persecution that he faced from the Catholic Church and from the government because of what he was trying to do. The elders, they hated Jesus. They were the judicious or people of experience. They abhor the red Christ of the Great Rebellion because he is not of this world with its habits and antiquated customs. This is how people get stuck into the customs and they always want things to be the same way. They won't accept anything new. They won't accept any change. And the scribes, they detest him because he is the antithesis of the Antichrist. Christ is the declared enemy of that putrid mass of academic theory. So these represent the intellectuals, the scientists that say oh, there's no such thing as the astral, there's no such thing as awakening consciousness, you know, these things don't exist. You can't prove them, they're not tangible, you can't hold them. So if you, this is a church against uh, spiritual studies, this is basically science and technology against spiritual studies. Look at it that way. Now we'll look at the black dragon and the dragon of wisdom. There's some really interesting symbolism in here. The three traitors together, they're often called the black dragon or the three-headed dragon, the three rebels. Rebel to nature, rebel to the science, and rebel to the truth. So we're still talking about the same concept, the manifestation of the ego. We're still talking about the demon of desire, demon of the mind, and demon of ill will, which is the same thing as Judas Pilate's type, Judas Pilate's Pilate Caiaphas, we're not talking about the same symbolism again and again and again, but now it appears as the black dragon. Okay? The opposite of the black dragon is what we call the resplendent dragon of wisdom. That's composed of the opposite, the antithesis to the three traitors, and that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which in Kabbalah on the Tree of Life appear as Keter Hogman Vina, the, the crown that sits at the top there. Okay, basically it's the Trinity. Okay, so we look at everybody's familiar with the Trinity, especially if you remember Christian background. The three traitors were the antithesis to the Trinity, the three opposing forces. So remember, nature always keeps that balance, right? If you've got a Trinity up here, you're going to have an inverted Trinity down there. And here's the Trinity on the top. We go down to the bottom, we see the reflection of the Trinity down there as well. And if you we're to draw the Dragon of Wisdom, that's what it would look like. And you can see that right on the top of the Tree of Life, Ketar, Hogman, Vina, and together these three form a triangle that points upwards. If you were to reflect that with the Black Dragon, you end up with a triangle that looks like this, with Demon of the Mind, Demon of Desire, and Demon of Ill Will. It's basically the opposing triangle, the opposite forces. When you put them together, you get the Seal of Solomon which you've probably seen before. Most people think this is like a Jewish thing, right? 
And you can thank that a lot in part to the problems that were happening in World War II because that was one of the things that the Jews were branded with. They had to have yellow stars and everything like that. Uh, it's a lot, this symbol is a lot older than Christianity and goes back quite far. Um, but people don't understand that. I have one on my ring and I went on a necklace and people are always saying Shalom and the Jewish expressions to me. And I gave up one and go trying to explain, no, no, it's not really a Jewish thing. You see, it goes back to and I thought, no, I just go Shalom. Sit down and go to the PowerPoint screen and say, have a seat. I need to show you something. <laughs> it looks like that. Now, this is a really interesting symbol because there's a ton of stuff contained in there. Because caught between the... Uh, <coughs> The two opposing forces, caught between the dragon of wisdom and the black dragon, we find ourselves trapped in the middle. Okay, we basically find our human soul caught between those two opposing forces, caught in that balance. The seal of Solomon is an, Solomon is an ancient esoteric symbol that contains many secrets. There's an amazing amount of symbolism in such a simple form. Okay, uh, the upwards pointing triangle. So this this. This simple one right here contains a ton of symbolism and it's used to represent a lot of different things. The first thing the upwards pointing triangle symbolizes <coughs> is the Trinity. We just looked at that, right? The concept of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That represents the Trinity. The other thing it represents is the macrocosm of the superior world. It's basically an arrow pointing up, pointing up to the dimensions that exist above us. It also represents the male phallus, so the male sex organs. And interestingly enough, it's the alchemical symbol for fire. When you look at the old alchemical symbols, you had a triangle that points up, you had one that looks like that, sorry, you had a triangle that points down, you had another one that looks like that. They were the four symbols for fire, earth, air, and water. It also represents the ascending serpent, the Kundalini, the bronze serpent of Moses. Remember, there was the two serpents in the Bible. There's the one he remembers, which is the one that tempted the youth to eat the apple when God was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, which represents the Kundar Tigador, the descending serpent. But remember, we looked at some biblical verse where the serpent appears again. Moses places the serpent on the path, or on a staff to heal the Israelites in the desert. Now, when you look at the opposite, when you look at the... Boy, Sorry, going to that biblical quote. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that's John 13. This is talking about the second serpent. Everybody remembers the first serpent. Nobody realizes the snake comes back again. So consequently, the snake is always seen as an evil, negative thing. But the snake does appear in the Bible later on, and it appears as the Kundalini, the rising serpent. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents. That's interesting because we think of the Kundalini as fire, right? Fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many, people, many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he taketh away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. We see the pole, the idea of the staff, the phallus, the willpower. Um, think of the uh, um, uh, caduceus of mercury, the shushumna, that center channel, the medullary channel for the spinal column. And if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and he would live. So that's the, the other place that the snake appears, and it represents the kundalini. And here it's saving people and and uh, uh, healing people that have been afflicted by the bad serpent. The bad serpent, of course, being the Kundar Tigridor. Okay, the energy going in the wrong direction. The downwards pointing triangle then symbolizes a bunch of stuff. As we looked at earlier, so now we're looking at the one that points down. That symbolizes the three traders, the black dragon that we talked about today. It also symbolizes the microcosmos, where our soul is trapped and fights against the black dragon. So upwards is the dimensions above us, downwards is kind of where we are trapped here. It also was a symbol of the female sex organs. You can think of that as representing a womb or, or the, the delta of Venus on a woman, right? That's kind of what that one represents as well. Interestingly enough, the alchemical symbol for water as well. So isn't that interesting? It also represents the descending serpent, the Kundar Tiguador, the Kunda Buffer, uh, the tail of Satan, the tempting serpent of Eden. And if we look then at the 
steel of Solomon as a whole, if we look at those two triangles interlaced, what we see is then the union of man and woman. The union of fire plus water, which is alchemy. It's an alchemical symbol. So you're looking at the phallus and the yoni intertwined. You're looking at fire merged with water. We see our soul caught between those two triangles, deciding or torn between them. It's the sexual dilemma. It's the dilemma of to be or not to be. Are we going up or are we going down? What is it that we're going to do? We're caught in between those two poles. We find ourselves trapped in the middle. Uh, when we see the triangle interlaced, we also see a representation of the 12 signs of the zodiac as well. So so when you look at that symbol, there's 12 masculine points, or sorry, six masculine points, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's six indentations, which are considered the feminine ones, one, two, three, four, five, six. So sometimes you'll see the 12 signs of the zodiac arranged around the seal of Solomon as well. And try explaining that next time somebody says shalom to you at the checkout of Walmart. <laughs> <laughs>